Well, good evening, friends, and welcome to another episode of Way Back Wednesday. I'm Randy Adcock. So glad you could be with us tonight. Um, I think we've got what I think is an interesting show. Um, I'm going to talk about a man tonight that probably most of you never heard of, may not know anything about. He was born right here in Rocky Mount, uh, performed the majority of his adult um, work life here in Rocky Mount, though he was away from the area for a short period of time. Um, but I found out earlier this week that this gentleman and I used to work together um, at Air Care. When I first got out of the Navy in 1986, um, I went to work out to Air Care out here um, in early 87, I guess it would have been then. And um, I worked in avionics. This gentleman worked in aircraft maintenance. He had semi-retired by then and was actually only working, I think, a few hours a day, a few days a week. And so, honestly, uh, when I heard his name, it didn't ring a bell with me. Um, I didn't recall working with him. And I have to be honest and say, I really, I've got, I've seen pictures, I'll show you pictures of him in, in a minute here. But um, for any of you that, that remembers uh, Mr. Foy Pulling, Pulling, P-U-L-L-E-N, Foy Pulling, um, I'd love to hear from you tonight. I'm going to leave the, the phone available for calls, as it usually is. 407-1111 is a number. Um, but this man led an absolutely fascinating life. And the more I read about him and the more I researched his history, uh, particularly his uh, his love of um, aviation and aircraft and principles of flight, um, and in later years, uh, safety of flight. He was very much instrumental in, in developing and um, uh, creating some of the safety protocols that we all are aware of now in, in aviation uh, safety realm. And so it was just really neat um, to learn more about this, mis this Mr. Pullen, uh, Foy Pullen, uh, I say he was born here in Rocky Mount, April 17, 1915. He took his first flight uh, in 1927 at the age of 12, 12 years old. Uh, and I guess you could say he got hooked at a very early age. And from that point on, um, he was either in an airplane, working on an airplane, under an airplane, somewhere around an airplane, uh, well into his senior years. Um, he actually began working in, in aircraft in a maintenance capacity back in the early 1930s. I saw one report said as early as 1930, others said 1934. Uh, but suffice it to say, very early on in his, in his working career, he was working all in around airplanes. Um, he soloed the first time in 1935. And so from that point on, um, he was just, as I said, heavily involved in aviation. Um, he trained pilots in World War II, um, just was very instrumental in, in getting uh, people interested in flying and in the aviation community. So we're going to start off tonight, um, and I'm going to share with you an article that sadly uh, was not one of the highlights of Foy Pullen's life or his, his history in aviation. Um, Lee, if you would go ahead and put up item number one, uh, the Rocky Mount Herald newspaper uh, had this article that appeared October the 2nd, 1936. And I'll read it for you. It's fairly short, so I'll read it to you. Uh, it says, Rights held for Plains victim. Uh, while E. Foy Pullen, 21, local pilot, today was reported recovering from injuries sustained in a weekend airplane crash at Greenville, his companion in the crash, L. E. Ross of Greenville, was buried in Pitt County. Mr. Pullen reported as the pilot of this ship which crashed Saturday afternoon near Greenville after it apparently failed to come out of a spin, was resting in a local hospital today. He was brought here Monday from a Greenville hospital where he and Mr. Rose were taken after the accident. Reports from the hospital indicated he was coming along satisfied despite his injuries. Uh, Pullen, Pullen's companion in the crash, uh, which occurred in the plane, uh, in the plane of uh, R. E. Lee, local airport manager, was Mr. Ross, and he died at the Greenville Hospital. He had both he had uh, both legs were broken in three places. His nose was broken. His teeth were knocked out. He was uh, he sustained a crushed chest and fractured hip. Um, so, sadly, um, this young fellow, uh, this young pilot, Foy pulled at 21 years old, had only been a pilot for literally a year, less than a year, in fact, um, was involved in his plane crash, and his friend. Uh, passed away as a result of the injury sustained in the crash. And, you know, it's, it would have been easy at that point for a young pilot, 21-year-old pilot, who had just gotten his pilot's license and just began his flying um, 
career, if you will, it would have been very easy for him to give up and say, you know what, this is too dangerous. Um, I don't want to take a chance on hurting anyone else or myself, so I'm going to give up uh, aviation altogether. But he didn't do that. Um, and in fact, uh, we all deal with tragedy and, and heartache in different ways. Item number two, uh, this article appeared in the Rocky Mount Telegram, June, uh, January the 30th, 1937. And um, it's a very short article, and I'll just read it to you. It says, North Rocky Mounters are sadly contemplating the case of Foy Pullen, the once bad man of the air who now has turned to crocheting. They say there's been a great change over Foy since he had an airplane crack up about five months ago. But Foy is inclined to think that he has acted wisely in order to conserve his time. He has been in bed all this time and is expecting to get up this weekend. Why shouldn't I crochet, asked Foy, if it will give me some real enjoyment? He gives the same answer to those who look in a puzzling manner at samples of his embroidery. He frowns, however, upon his little sister, Nellie, when she calls him sister. So literally five or six months after the plane crash, he was still bedridden. He had taken up crocheting as, as a way to take his mind off things and couldn't do much of anything else anyway, I suppose, from his injuries. And so he took up crochet, and, and you know, for, for a man who lived the life that he lived, it, it seems odd to think that of all the possible hobbies he could have undertaken, uh, crocheting just doesn't seem to be in the round, but indeed it was. Um, fast forward to 1948, um, he became, as I said, involved in aircraft maintenance and, uh, and flying. Uh, he began to teach people to fly, and um, he started a business. Item number three, if you would, Lee, this article appeared, this uh, advertisement, I should say, appeared in the Rocky Mount Telegram, May the 7th, 1948. And you see there he is, Mr. E. Foy Pullen, Pullen says, we're uh, pleased to announce that Foy Pullen has moved back home to Rocky Mount and is associated with Raleigh Lee in the operation of Avalon Airport. Uh, Avalon Air Service, located at Leggett Highway, number 95. Um, some of you may remember uh, Avalon Airport. It's out on what we now refer to as Highway 97, out east of Rocky Mountain. Um, but anyway, he was uh, engaged in business out there uh, as an aircraft maintenance uh, person and, and working on aircraft airplanes. Um, you know, and prior to this, interestingly enough, he was also, I read, he was very much involved in barnstorming. If you're not familiar with that term, I'm sure you've seen old movies where these. Uh, pilots that were primarily crop dusters, I think it's safe to say, not all were, but, but a good many barnstormers were crop pilots who were used to flying dangerous flight paths, low and slow over fields and so forth. Um, but barnstorm became very popular in the 20s and 30s, even into the 40s, and these pilots just did death-defying acts. They would fly the plane upside down, for example, or put it into a death spiral or roll or, you know, do these amazing loops in the sky. Um, and they would have sometimes uh, wing walkers, uh, guys who would strap themselves onto the wings, top of the airplane, uh, aircraft on the wings, and, and walk along the wing surface while the plane was flying along, or they would hang out on the, on the bottom of the wing while the plane was flying along. But all of this was just, you know, it was, it was show, it was um, all in good fun, certainly, very dangerous, obviously. But he was involved in that too. But by 1948, as I said, he had become really more interested in, in the business end of flying, and so. This article appears, as I said, May the 7th. Three days later, May the 8th, Lee, if you would have put up item number four for us, it's the same picture. They used the same picture in two different ads. Uh, but this ad says, let Foy pull in, repair or overhaul your airplane. 100 hour inspections and license all types and models, airplanes, any repair, <coughs> excuse me, any repair to any airplane. And again, you see it says Avalon Air Service located two and a half miles out on Leggett Highway 95. And of course, this was way before Interstate 95 came through here, so this was actually Highway 97 at that, at that time. But um, as I said, he was very much into the whole aviation community. Uh, he was very active in, in getting, uh, building up interest in the area in flying and in airplanes. And uh, along with that, um, you know, he was just very, very much involved in, um, in making sure that the, not only was the experience of flying enjoyable, uh, but that it was safe, and he became known over years as being just uh, very, very much attuned to the aircraft and its flight characteristics and, and how to keep an airplane safe as, as was possible. And, um, but there was another side to Foy Pullen also. He was a very religious man, I gather. 
And um, item number five, Lee, if you would, uh, this uh, picture and subcaption appeared in the Rocky Mount Telegram September 19, 1956. And the third gentleman to your left there is Foy Pullen. And the caption reads, groundbreaking for church. This was the scene as members of the building committee and the pastor gathered at the Marvin Methodist Church for groundbreaking ceremonies for their new church. In the picture are left to right John Jones, Fletcher Harper, Foy Pullen, Carvey Strickland, the Reverend L.C. Brothers Jr., who's the pastor, uh, Nelson Jeans, Chairman Shelton Gallup, and Mrs. Melvin Ensco. Um, I never attended this church, though it was literally within walking distance of my home and my grandparents' home. If you recall me saying it from past shows, uh, when we were little, I lived on Columbia Avenue, one block off of Falls Road. Um, my grandparents lived at the end of uh, Spring Street, on number seven East Spring Street, and the Marvin Methodist Church was right there beside the hot dog stand on Falls Road. And so 1956 was before my time, so I don't remember when this took place, but I certainly remember the church being there. I walked by it many a time going to the hot dog stand as a young fellow, walked with my grandparents down there and even by myself on occasion. Uh, but anyway, that was in 1956. I saw several references to um, Mr. and Ms. Pullen both being heavily involved with their church. And it, it was just a, another side to the man that um, you might not think of uh, would be associated with someone who was involved to the, to the level that he was with aviation and flying. But at the same time, you know, it makes you wonder, well, maybe he realized that the, on occasion he was uh, doing things that were dangerous in terms of his flying, and, and so maybe it helped to have a good relationship with the Lord while you're involved in his very, at times, very dangerous uh, career. Um, number six, Lee, if you would, item number six is, uh, this is from Rocky Mount Telegram, March 3rd, 1959. And the caption reads, shown here during ceremony in which the Rocky Mount Air Service was officially designated as a certified repair station, our left to right Steve Boynton, aviation safety inspector of the FAA in Raleigh office, uh, Foy Pullen, the general manager of the station, and L.P. Broadfield, president of the Air Service. So this business was started, Rocky Mount Air Service, and it was a combination of things, working on airplanes, offering maintenance, uh, repair options, and so forth. Um, I don't know if they were actually selling airplanes, though I would imagine if someone had a plane they wanted to sell, um, they would be assisting in, in the sale of an airplane from one individual to another, these kinds of things. Um, also, um, in the same uh, article, same issue, I should say, the Rocky Mount Telegram, that this appeared, uh, there was a nice write-up, and if you would just put up number seven, which is the write-up that, that was associated with this picture. I'm not going to read this whole thing, but I'm going to read a few things to you just that I thought were uh, interesting. It says, the headline reads, Air Service Designation Certified Repair Station, or designated as a certified repair station. L.P. Broadfell, manager of the Rocky Mountain Air Service, announced here today that the local flying and aircraft maintenance firm was recently given another accreditation by the FAA. Rocky Mount Air Service was designated as a certified repair station for aircraft and engines and must maintain certain government standards and quality excellence in aircraft and engine repair. So, and of course, uh, Foy Pullen was the general manager of the service. At this time, he had over 20 years experience in aircraft and engine maintenance. Um, and he had another mechanic friend of his, a guy named Charlie Brown. I remember Charlie Brown quite well. Charlie did work there. Um, during the time I did as well at Air Care, and, and for some reason I, I remember Charlie, I can't say specifically that I remember Foy Pullen, but I definitely remember Charlie Brown. He was a good guy, heck of a mechanic, uh, knew an airplane inside and out. Uh, but anyway, uh, this was a, a, a big deal for Rocky Mount to have a facility with this designation, and in fact people from outside the area would bring their airplanes here to have these two guys, because between uh, Foy Pullen and Charlie Brown, the two of them, um, had like 60 some years combined experience and so if there was a problem that, that they couldn't fix you needed a new airplane. They, it was, they were that good between the two of them. Okay Lee, let's move on then. Item number eight. The News and Observer um, had this article uh, it appeared November 19, 1961 and as it turns out, and I looked by the way to see what I could find between 1959 when the Rocky Mount Air Service article appeared in 1961 when this article appeared and I literally couldn't find anything in between these two. 
But in 1961, this article says, basically the Rocky Mountain Municipal Airport is a business that by all indications will be successful because it serves a growing need in a modern community. Business is good. There's a friendly atmosphere. Several planes landed, taxied up to the gas pumps, and were promptly serviced by James Matthews. Um, and then it goes on to talk about the first the shop. Foy Pullen, shop manager and licensed aircraft inspector, has been in aviation maintenance and flying for 27 years. Uh, it goes on to talk about the shop is equipped for major overhaul and repairs to aircraft and engines. The mechanic, Charles Brown, uh, well, well, mechanics, plural, there's more than one, obviously. Charles Brown, El Elbert Brown, Bill Williams, and Jesse Brown, with Pullen, have a combined total of 65 years' experience. So, Air Care basically took over, from what I'm gathering here, what used to be the Rocky Mount Air Service. And expanded capabilities, operations. They went from just being a place to have your plane serviced and worked on uh, to selling fuel and so forth. And um, in later years, aircraft uh, sales became part of the uh, offering for air care. And uh, it was just a, you know, it was a growing business. And there was a, a growing interest too in Rocky Mountain and in this area, Eastern North Carolina. Uh, a lot of people began flying. Um, I, said before I took lessons myself. I sadly never finished, never got my license, but I did for a while uh, take flying lessons. But it was something that used to be much more affordable than it, than it has become certainly over the years. Um, but uh, to AirCare's credit, um, AirCare was, was very instrumental uh, with the help of people like Foy Pullen and Charlie Brown and, and some of the um, other instructors that worked for AirCare over the years, and certainly J.B. Williams, who um, was at the helm of air care literally up until just the last year uh, when he sold the business. Um, but in any case, by 1961, air care had taken over what, what was previously the Rocky Mountain Air Service uh, and expanded operations. Uh, item number nine, if you would, Lee, this ad appeared in a News and Observer. Uh, November 19, 1961, and it's a little hard to read. I'm not going to try to read all of this. I just want to kind of point a few things out to you. Um, they were, as I said, they were starting to sell airplanes, and um, this is the upper left-hand corner is the Piper Apache, um, references a top speed of 160 miles an hour, it's a five-seat plane. Uh, bottom, uh, well, next on the right-hand side is a Cessna 182, um, and then it lists the pilot staff, Elbert Brown, um, uh, George uh, Bullafontaine, M.M. M. Roddy, L.W. Battle, L.P. Broadfield. And then down at the very bottom, that picture of those five gentlemen down there, the one on the far left is Charlie Brown. I recognize him immediately. And then the other guys are uh, Bill Williams, Albert Brown, Jesse Brown, and on the far right is Foy Pullen. So, as I said, uh, this was at the Municipal Airport over on Church Street before the Rocky Mount Wilson Airport came into being. And air care had began to grow and, and attract more business, more types of business. Um, you know, Piedmont Airlines um, used Rocky Mount as a hub for a number of years, and so there was a lot more traffic coming in and out of Rocky Mount Airport and a lot more going on in the aviation community here around Rocky Mount. I see it's time for our first commercial break, so let us go ahead and take a break. When we come back, we're going to talk a little bit more about air care, a little bit more about Foy Pullen, and talk a little more about uh, what his contribution was and what it meant to not only local aviation, but to the aviation community across the country. So don't go anywhere. We'll be, we'll be right back with more right, uh, Way Back Wednesday. Take it away, Lee. I'm Daniel Moss, owner of Cornerstone Funeral Home, and I'd like to invite you and your family to give our family an opportunity to serve you in your time of need. And we offer a full line of funeral services, everything from visitations to graveside services to cremations on site with a live crematory, as well as a banquet hall to meet the catering needs of our families that we serve. We offer catering service, we offer refreshments prior to visitation and services of our family, and we want to invite you to come and experience the difference here. If you or your loved one is living with hearing loss, and if you haven't found a solution that fits your lifestyle, 
then you should consult with the local experts at the new Hearing Aid Urgent Care in Nashville, North Carolina. Hearing Aid Urgent Care is a place to go for over-the-counter hearing solutions that will improve your daily life and communication between your loved ones and you. Purchasing in our store does not require any prescription or medical recommendation. Our team of experts does recommend a hearing examination so we can help you purchase the correct product for your personal needs. We hold regular listen and learn events so you can ask questions and work with the high quality products from our vendors to find out what hearing device will best suit you before you buy. Open Friday and Saturday, 11 a.m. to 7 p.m. And you can call 252-459-4008 to find out more information. Hearing Aid Urgent Care, located at 102 West Nashville Drive in Nashville, North Carolina. When faced with special care needs for elderly or disabled loved ones, families want compassionate, comforting care. That's Tender Touch Home Care Services' goal, providing the level of care we would expect for our own. With over 10 years of home care excellence, Tender Touch provides an array of services that keeps your loved one at home. From personal care, light housekeeping, errands, and meal preparation, to our private duty care program, which combines all of our home care offerings in one package. Tender Touch Home Care Services, where your needs are our concern. We're in our 18th year of practice at the Hammer Chiropractic Center, and we've seen over 15,000 different people in the Rocky Mountain area. 40% of headaches actually come from a neck problem. Many patients come in taking multiple aspirin, over-the-counter medications and such a day, and we can get you to stop doing that and actually fix the problem so the headaches don't rise anymore. A lot of people think chiropractic hurts. It does not. Most of the people come in and they feel great when they leave. And we're back, we're back. If you're just tuning in, folks, uh, by the way, today is May the 3rd, 2023, uh, and I, I saw something on the internet I wanted to share. It was at the top of the show, and I forgot it. Um, apparently, uh, someone was making a funny on the internet and said they finally figured out how the month of May became known as May. Uh, and as the story goes, um, some fellow decided that it may rain, it may snow, it may be 60 degrees, it may be 90 degrees, it may be warm, it may be cold, it may be sunny, it's the month of May. But there you go. Um, anyway, we were talking about Foley pulling and air care and the aviation community in Rocky Mount. You know, we talked about J.D. Winston in pre uh, prior shows. We talked about um, Janice Gravely, oh, Janet Gravely, and, and well, Janice, I think was her name, uh, and her uh, ordeal when her husband had a heart attack and passed away at the pilot of the plane they were in and, and crashed and she ended up having to, um, you know, crawl through all kind of um, cold snowy ground so able to get to help. So there's been, you know, a lot of history in and around Rocky Mountain in the aviation community. Uh, a lot of tragedy certainly, but a lot of really good things have happened and certainly the Rocky Mountain Wilson Airport um, is, is a very modern airport by, by anybody's standards now and we can, something we can be proud of. But it, uh, you know, it took men like Foy Pullen and J.B. Williams and Charlie Brown and some of these other uh, men we were talking about earlier, the pilots, that helped uh, foster and, and bring aviation to Rocky Mount in a, in a much bigger way than, than it would have otherwise been. So let's move ahead, Lee. Item number 10, May 12, 1963. Uh, this ad appeared in the Rocky Mount Telegram uh, for air care, and there's a lot going on here, but I'm just going to talk about a couple of things. Number one, in 1963, you could get your pilot's license with 15 hours of dual instruction and then 20 hours of solo time. And there was also a little package deal that air care had put together. Uh, you got an eight-hour dual instructor in a Colt aircraft. Uh, you could continue into Colt uh, with dual instruction. After that, for so many uh, hours, um, you could go to audiovisual ground school with color slides and books. You could get all of this for $447. Um, now, if you remember, I, I've said this a couple times in previous shows, I actually, when I was in the Navy, I was stationed for a period of time in um, a little town called Millington, Tennessee, just south of Memphis. And one day shortly after I got to, to that base, we had a visitor from the local airport. And they were trying to solicit people to take flying lessons. 
And um, I remember very distinctly uh, the guy saying, you know, for the low, low price of $800, you can get your private pilot license and become a pilot. Now, keep in mind, this was strictly civilian. Even though we were all in the military, we were being offered this military discount to learn to get a private pilot's license. Wouldn't entitle us to have flown any military aircraft, but we certainly would have been a legally licensed pilot to pilot, you know, civilian aircraft. Um, of course, it, you know, that $800 may have, might as well have been a million for me. I was making very little money back then uh, and certainly couldn't afford to take any pilot license, uh, flying lessons and so forth. But that was in the early 1980s. In the 1960s, for 400, less than $500, you could get your pilot's license. And that was a lot of money, granted, for a lot of people that was still out of reach and, and that's why I'd, I guess the more prominent people were more likely to become pilots, certainly than the average everyday Joe. But still, uh, $447, uh, and it said you can get your license in less than 90 days. So it was certainly doable, and so a lot of people got involved in flying, and um, there was a lot of a lot of good came about from all that. Uh, we'll talk about some fundraisers here in a minute. It was going on, and, and that was really worthwhile. Let's move on, Lee. Item number 20, uh, I'm sorry, item number 11. This ad appeared May 26, 1963. And I mentioned earlier that AirCare had really taken what was a really basic business operation with the Rocky Mountain Air Service uh, from, the, from the early days out of the old Avalon Airport. And they had, you know, nursed it along and, and, and give J.B. Williams a lot of credit. J.B. was responsible in large part for uh, the direction that AirCare took. Uh, you see there on this ad, it says, Flying is fun. Ask about our May specials on pilot training and audiovisual ground school for private pilots. Um, other, services all other services included aircraft rental, air taxi, uh, maintenance, passenger rides. Uh, for four or five bucks, you could take a couple of friends with you and go for an airplane ride. But, um, you know, again, it was part of this effort to bring aviation to the masses, if you will, and make it a more common occurrence to be able to be involved with flying and to get in, in an aircraft and, and fly around. Uh, I took my first uh, flight in an airplane at about 12 years old out of the old municipal airport out on Church Street. Uh, my, I had an uncle who was a private pilot and um, he took myself and my father up and we flew around Rocky Mount for, I don't know, 30, 40 minutes and then came back down and landed. But um, I, I always thought it was the neatest thing in the world to be able to fly an airplane. And to this day, I love flying. I just don't, can't afford to do it as much as I used to, as much as I'd like to, I should say. Okay, let's move on then. Item number 12, this is a picture I stumbled across. It doesn't really have anything to do with Foy pulling, um, but it certainly has to do with the flying community in Rocky Mount. And like I said, this appeared in your telegram August the 9th, 1965. And I'm going to read the caption here. You may recognize some of these folks. Um, it says, Solo Trophies. Four local pilots are shown with solo trophies awarded by Eastern Airmen's Association at, at a meeting last night. In the picture left to right are Mrs. Carol Daltridge, George Morgan, Grant Brogdon, and Dan Vaughn. Um, when I heard that name, when I read that name, Dan Vaughn, I, I had to stop the thing. I said, oh my goodness. This picture appeared in 1965 in the Rocky Mount Telegram. And a year later, a year later Dan Vaughn and I became neighbors. In 1966, uh, my parents bought a home right down the street from Dan and Beverly Vaughn. And I've, I've known him ever since then, in fact, and never knew he was a pilot, never knew he'd ever flown. Uh, he worked in the insurance industry, sold insurance for a number of years. But in 1965, he got his solo pilot's license and was a pilot. And the ad, I mean, the uh, caption goes on to say, some 80 members of association and wives and husbands attended a cookout sponsored by Rocky Mount Aerial Applicators and Air Care Incorporated. The trophies went to members who made first solo flight since the last meeting. So this was something that was, you know, it was being uh, talked about, it was being publicized, it was being promoted heavily, not only by air care, but by these local clubs, and there were more than one uh, flying clubs around Rocky Mount and in eastern North Carolina, and so they would have these fly-in events, and it was, just, it was generating interest and generating enthusiasm for flying and for the flying community. And again, uh, it was in large part due to uh, the efforts of J.B. Williams and Foy Pullen and other people involved with air care that 
got this process even going stronger. Item number 13, Lee, if you would, this article, or this ad, I should say, appeared in the Rocky Mountain Telegram August 22nd, 1965, just a few short weeks after the other article, and it, it talks about becoming a pilot. It says, if you've never flown an airplane, just $5 puts you at the controls of a Cessna 150. So what they were doing was a special promotion. They would take you up for $5, and kind of give you a, a taste, if you will, of what it would be like. Um, you'd get a chance to actually control the aircraft, it says. You'd have control of the airplane for a short period of time. And so, and there was, um, uh, these events would take place. They would have uh, parachutes come out and, and, you know, put on aerobatic shows, jump out at planes with parachutes, of course. And uh, it was just, you know, a big promotion. And there was just a lot of interest being generated by people involved in the aviation community in and around Rocky Mountain. And it, uh, as interest spread, um, it became more uh, of something that more of us want to get involved with. Item number 14, if you would, Lee, uh, this picture appeared in the Rocky Mountain Telegram August 29, 1969. And you see it's out there at NAS, at the time it was called Nash Technical Institute. We now know it as Nash Community College. But it says, the caption reads, sign goes up, a sign designating the former Stony Creek School property as the new home of Nash County Technical Institute goes on at Stony Creek location. Taking part in the final phase of the sign erection are left to right Gene Pridgen, drafting instructor, Jack Ballard, president of the institute, Ann Winstead, business instructor, and Foy Pullen, administrative assistant. So Foy had his you know, hands in several different things around Rocky Mountain. And I, I really did not realize that he was also involved in the Nash Community College, uh, but apparently he was, and indeed was out involved in, in getting the groundbreaking um, out there from when the college was being erected out there at Nash Community College where it is today. Okay, let's fast forward a bit, Lee. Um, October 1973, uh, I don't know, 15, there you go. It says, making plans for flight. Carlton Williams to the left, Chairman of the White King Committee of the Rocky Mount Luncheon Lions Club meets with representatives of Aircare Incorporated to make plans for a Flying for the Blind project this Sunday that will provide public scenic flights from the Rocky Mount Wilson Airport. Um, with Williams are Foy Pullen, Vice President of Aircare, and Sandra Moore, Aircare Office Manager. Um, this event, I, I saw several references to it became a big deal. It was, a, it was a joint effort between Air Care and the Lions Club to raise money for the blind. And it was called Flying for the Blind. And they would have all kind of promotional activities again out at the airport. Um, they would have uh, people jump out of airplanes. They would have stunt pilots. They would have free rides. Um, well, not necessarily free, because it was a fundraiser. They would charge, I think, with so much, maybe 15, 20 cents per pound. Uh, because, you know, you load an airplane based on weight, and so uh, they had to know how much you weighed to get on the plane, and they would charge you so much per pound. Uh, but it was, you know, very little, but the whole thing was to raise money for the blind. And it was very successful. It raised quite a bit of money. Um, this picture appeared October of 1973 at this particular event. A year later, in October 1974, they held another one. Lee, item number 16, if you would. Um, this just talks, this was in the National Graphic, by the way, and this was kind of an odd shaped uh, ad that appeared or article that appeared. And I'm not going to read the whole thing, but there's a couple points I want to just point out to you. First of all, uh, this was the Nashville Graphic, as I said earlier, October 22nd, 1974. And this is a member of the Rocky Mount Sports Parachute Club guides his way toward the ground during the benefit show sponsored by the Rocky Mount Luncheon Lions Club and Air Care Incorporated. Uh, they raised $1,700 to aid the blind and visually handicapped. Uh, included in the activities were flights over the airport and the Tar River Reservoir. Uh, of course, by this time, I should have mentioned this, by this time, Air Care uh, was out at the new airport, which went and operated, I think, in 1971, 70, 72, somewhere along there. So by this time, we're at the new airport, uh, much, much bigger operation out there. Um, in fact, they said this was the largest crowd we ever had. Uh, we flew 821 people, uh, carried 95,000 pounds of people, um, said eight planes were used in the flights. We moved the crowd faster and could carry more people. We kept up a steady pace all day. 
Uh, the Rocky Mountain Sports Parachute Club entertained visitors with precision jumps in full view of the spectators. Uh, participating in the parachute exhibitions were Bud McClam, Buddy Lotta, uh, Joey Barnes, Debbie Riddle, Phil Boone, and Marvin Farmer. So this became an annual event. I'm not sure when it stopped be becoming an annual event, but for several years anyway, uh, they raised money for the blind, the Lions Club, in conjunction with Air Care, and it was quite successful. Uh, this particular show here raised $1,700, and it was a, a, I don't remember seeing a number for the previous year's show, but this, by all expectations and by all accounts, uh, exceeded the previous year by, by a considerable amount of money and uh, attendees to the event. So, okay. All right, let's go on in. Item number 17. This picture appeared in the Rocky Mount Telegram September 22nd, 1980. The picture is kind of grainy. You probably recognize that's the old hangar out on Church Street. And, uh, and I'll read the caption here because to me the caption was the most important part of this picture. And it says, moving up. Air Care Incorporated employees are packing up and making final preparations to move from their old facility at Rocky Mount Municipal Airport to new quarters in expanded Rocky Mount Wilson Airport. Uh, Municipal Airport closed Friday, so this was on September 22nd, 1980. Uh, this is when the Rocky Mount, uh, the old Municipal Airport officially closed. And it says, um, after several days, time to uh, allow time for RWI to prepare for increased traffic. The runway at Municipal closes today, Air Care Manager J.B. Williams said this morning. No definite plans for the site have been announced. Sadly, if you recall, um, because of some chemical spills and some contamination of the soil out there, it was many years before anything could be done out there, and uh, it took a lot of work to get to place so it could be used for anything else. And of course, now the old Municipal Airport is a, uh, a sports site, and um, no one that goes out there for regular sporting events would, would ever known there was an airport there unless someone told them. Um, but, you know, it's, it's really nice that they were able to take that facility and, and those grounds and, and rework them and, and clean up the, uh, the contaminated soil and, and make that place really something special now. And it's, it's a really nice sporting complex out there. Okay, let's move on. Item number 18. This article appeared um, right in the Rocky Mountain Telegram, March 14, 1982. And this was one of, the, one of the more detailed articles about Foy Pullen. Uh, it says, Foy Pullen of Battleboro was presented an Aviation Safety Award recently at the Wilson Technical Institute. The award was presented by Gary Sigelson, FAA Accident Prevention Specialist with the FAA General Aviation District Office in Raleigh. Uh, the award was presented for outstanding and tenuous service to aviation safety. This is only the second time this award has been presented in Eastern North Carolina. Uh, Pullen has been employed by Rocky Mount Air Care uh, for 22 years. Uh, it says he currently holds a commercial pilot cert uh, certificate, airplane single and multi-engine um, rating. Uh, he's been an FAA certified flight instructor since 1938. His credit includes 44 years as an air, and keep in mind this is 1982 now, uh, 44 years as an aircraft mechanic, airframe and power plant, 25 years as an inspector, for aircraft maintenance. Um, he served as a designated flight examiner for 15 years, uh, power plant examiner for 23 years. Pullen was one of the first flight instructors in a civilian pilot training program in 1938. He served as a flight instructor for the 55th Army Air Force Training Detachment in Bennettsville, South Carolina for 18 months during World War II. He was instrumental in helping to convert military type aircraft to crop dusters. He also converted many mili uh, military aircraft to civilian status at the end of the war. Um, it says he began his career in 1934, the era when barnstorming was winding down and aviation was taking roots. He worked as a barnstormer for a couple of years. During this era of aviation, certificates and education were obtained by a little formal instruction uh, because very little was available. Uh, of course, home study and a lot of self-taught experience. Pullen summed it up good by saying, experience is when you get the test before you get the lesson. So, you know, he had an extraordinary career. Um, and this is in 82. He wasn't done, by the way, in 82. Tell you what, let's go ahead and take our next commercial break. When we come back, we're going to share a little bit more with you about Foy Pullen and some of the things that he accomplished and some of the uh, people that were around him. 
Uh, it was just a remarkable story from A to Z. So when we come back, we'll talk a little bit more about Floyd Pillow Chase and Little Fisher. So don't go anywhere. We'll be right back with more Way Back Wednesday. Crematory, as well as a banquet hall to meet the catering needs of our families that we serve. We offer catering service, we offer refreshments prior to visitation and services of our family, and we want to invite you to come and experience the difference here at Cornerstone Funeral Home. If you or your loved one is living with hearing loss, and if you haven't found a solution that fits your lifestyle, then you should consult with the local experts at the New Hearing Aid Urgent Care in Nashville, North Carolina. Hearing Aid Urgent Care is a place to go for over-the-counter hearing solutions that will improve your daily life and communication between your loved ones and you. Purchasing in our store does not require any prescription or medical recommendation. Our team of experts does recommend a hearing examination so we can help you purchase the correct product for your personal needs. We hold regular listen and learn events so you can ask questions and work with the high quality products from our vendors to find out what hearing device will best suit you before you buy. Open Friday and Saturday, 11 a.m. to 7 p.m. And you can call 252-459-4008 to find out more information. Hearing Aid Urgent Care located at 102 West Nashville Drive in Nashville, North Carolina. And we're back. We're back. Uh, before the break, we were talking about uh, Foy Pullen and his long career in aviation at Rocky Mount and his contributions to aviation and to aircraft safety. And, uh, you know, just like I said, I, I worked uh, in the same place as Mr. Pullen. Uh, I was there probably, I don't know, maybe less than a year, about a year perhaps. Um, and I'm sure our paths had to cross at some point. He had, didn't actually officially retire until 1982. Um, by 82, he had certainly began to wind down and slow down. He was already in his 60s by then. But um, anyway, he, like I said, he kept flying. Um, I think when he finally gave up flying, he had been flying for 58 years, uh, which is remarkable in itself. Uh, most pilots don't, don't try to fly that long, frankly. Many can't, aren't physically able to do it, but he certainly did. But um, his, uh, his career spanned many decades, and he actually, um, is well known in, in flying circles. Um, people who uh, had owned airplanes and, and had him, you know, service them. I read several articles that said people from as far away as Raleigh would bring an airplane to Rocky Mount to have it worked on, uh, as opposed to having it serviced in Raleigh area because they trusted Foley Pullen and Charlie Brown uh, so much more than the mechanics back in Raleigh. And so that says something about the man's, you know, character and his quality of work. Um, I read that he was tough at times, but fair. Uh, attention to detail comes to mind. It's an old military term. Um, and though he never served in the military himself, um, he certainly did serve by training pilots uh, who would, of course, go on to, to fly planes in the military during World War II. And his, um, you know, his processes and his techniques and his methods um, were handed down to future aircraft mechanics and the policies and protocols and, um, and methods for making sure that aircraft were and are safe to fly, not only for the pilot but for the passengers, um, was foremost in his mind. 
Um, item number 19, if you could, Lee, put that up on the screen for our viewers. Uh, August 20th, 1992, uh, this article appeared. It was actually uh, a couple different uh, segments of this article. We'll, we'll go through them one by one. But this just talks about, it says, uh, he recalls uh, the piling days. It starts off, it was a time of knee-high leather boots and flowing scars, a time when a man in a wood and canvas flying machine was a romantic daredevil. Rocky Mount's Foy Pullen was one of them, one of those daring young pioneers who rode the wind and gave birth to an industry. We'd fly into a little town and land where we could in a peanut field or pastures, he said. We'd sell tickets for $5 and take them up for a flight. We'd be there as long as people would come out, and then we'd fly off to somewhere else. The only thing we shut down for was night. During the Great Depression, they fence hopped across the Carolinas and Virginia and brought a flash of razzle-dazzle and excitement to the farmers and small-town folks mired in the gray days of the Great Depression. It was also the beginning of a half-century career in aviation, a career that spanned the age of flight from biplanes to space shuttles. I used to live across the Tar River from the field where the plane would land on, he said. I'd hear them one coming and I'd take off for the field. You couldn't keep me away. I'd cut brush to clear the field or haul gasoline in five-gallon cans or wash airplanes, anything to be around them. I was a real pest and in the way, but I was in love with airplanes. Um, and, you know, it just, when you read something like this about the man, you, you know he, he got bitten by the bug, if you will, at a very early age. And um, to, to go through a career like he had um, and stay with it through all that he went through, obviously, uh, says something about the man's intestinal fortitude. Let's move on, Lee, item number 20. Uh, this is actually just another continuation of that same article. And um, he retired at age 77 from air care, technically. Um, and he had been employed there since 1960, it said. Um, he had a 58-year uh, career in aviation, as I said. Uh, his first plane ride was in a World War I surplus OX-5 aircraft. OX-5, by the way, is an engine designation. Um, said his first instruction was in a 1934 airplane, OX-5 Callenger. Uh, he barnstormed North Carolina in the late 1930s using an OX-5 KR-31 and an OX-5 Travel Air. Uh, he was a mechanic and a pilot and the first fixed base operator in Rocky Mount. Um, he taught in J-3s and Waco UPFs. Um, he was a U.S. Air Force flight instructor. Of course, back then it was no, not called U.S. Air Force, it was called U.S. Army Air Force. But in any case, he was a flight instructor for them in World War II. Um, and like I said, he's had a remarkable career. Um, and there's just one accolade after another. Uh, and Lee, I don't remember 21, this is just the same picture that appeared in that other uh, previous picture. But I wanted to put it out there so maybe someone would, would you might recognize Mr. Pullen. And I forgot to put them up earlier, 407 11, 11. If you have a memory or if you knew Foy Pullen, would like to share a, a memory of him. Uh, maybe you worked with him, maybe you flew with him. Um, I, I would love to hear from him. Uh, there's been a couple of books written about and by him. When he was 93 years old, he co-authored a book about 90 years of aviation in, in North Carolina. And I'm trying to get my hands on a copy of that book. So if any of you know where there's one anywhere around, I'd love to have a copy of it. Uh, but he, in his book, he talks about, you know, growing up in the aviation community and being involved with it on so many different levels. But this was him, uh, August of 1992, um, leaning up against an airplane out there at the Rocky Mountain Wilson Airport. Okay, Lee, let's go ahead then. Item number 23. Um, oh, we got a call. Let's get this call. Hello, caller. You on the air? All right, I'll be very quick. There's two or three things I want to tell you about Mr. Pullen. Okay. First of all, he had a son that graduated from high school with me named Ed Pullen, who also became a pilot. That's right. Piedmont Airlines. That's right. Mr. Foy Pullen wrote a little book, and inside that book there was a little story back in the early days of aviation where a single-engine plane left the old Rocky Mountain Airport, went south, and crashed into the building, and downtown Rocky Mount, where Dillon Supply is, the airplane engine went through the roof and was found on the floor in the third floor of the Dillon Supply building. That story is in that book that Foy Pullen wrote. Uh -huh. Also, Mr. Foy Pullen, before he and his wife died, they celebrated their 75th wedding anniversary. They sure did. I got a picture of that in a few minutes coming up. I sure do. <laughs> hey, goodbye. All right, buddy. Thank you. 
Yeah, you know, to say the man had a remarkable career is an understatement for sure. Uh, it's just incredible. This, uh, go ahead and leave item number 22 if you would. Um, and this picture, I apologize, the picture itself is kind of crappy. I don't know what happened to it. It, it appears to have been damaged uh, at some point. But anyway, March 15, 1998, this picture appeared in the caption, Charles Brown, deceased, and Edwin Floyd Pullen were recognized this week by the Federal Aviation Administration with Charles Taylor Master Mechanic Awards. By the way, Charles Taylor, you probably never heard of that man. Charles Taylor was a, the mechanic for Orville and Wilbur Wright. Um, you always hear about Orville and Wilbur Wright being the ones who flew the first airplane, and they did, but they had a mechanic to help them, and his name was Charles Taylor. Uh, and so this Master Mechanic Award became known, uh, named after Charles Taylor. And so um, in 1998, um, Foy Pullen, and by this time, unfortunately, Charlie Brown had passed away. And so he was awarded a certificate in, in, um, uh, posthumously, and his wife received it. But it says from left, uh, Irma Pullen and Foy Pullen, and then, of course, J.B. Williams in the background there, owner of Air Care, and then Mary Brown, who accepted the award on behalf of her husband, and Phil Randall of the FAA. So in, in and around aircraft and uh, aviation maintenance circles, this Charles Taylor Master Mechanic Award is about as good as it gets. I mean, it is really a prestigious award, and it's, it's something that you just don't hear about. And for Air Care to have two former employees earning that prestigious award says something about uh, the, the operation of Air Care and J.B. Williams and the people that, that worked out there. I'm sure both those gentlemen would tell you they were a team uh, and it took more than just either one of these two men, Floyd Pullen or Charlie Brown, to, to get this award. Uh, it took the efforts of everyone working together out there and, and that's how it happened. But in any case, it was a very prestigious award. Um, March 15, 1990, was, was when this occurred. There was a really nice article that appeared with this picture. Item number 23, I'm not going to read this whole thing. It's kind of a long article. There's a couple things I just want to kind of point out. Um, we've got number 23. There you go. This, is, uh, this appeared along with that picture I just showed you uh, in March 15, 1998. But it says... Um, Edwin Foy Pullen was presented the Charles Taylor Master Mechanic Award by Phil Randall. Uh, Pullen's longtime friend, Charles Brown, who died October the 17th, 1997, was honored posthumously. His widow, Mary, accepted the Charles Taylor Master Mechanic Award on Brown's behalf. Uh, very seldom do we get to a chance to meet, much less work with a man like Edwin Foy Pullen, Randall said. He is a man who has contributed greatly to further the cause of aviation safety. It is with much pleasure and admiration that we honor Pullen and Brown as two of only a few recipients in this, of this prestigious award. Um, and it goes on to talk about the first plane flight that Pullen took and his long career in aviation maintenance. Um, and they talk about Charlie Brown and uh, his wife talks a little bit about Charlie and says, he had a steerman he needed to sell because he was starting his military service with the Air Force. And that, I mean, no, this is, this is uh, Foy Pullen talking about Charlie Brown. He says, he had a steerman he needed to sell because he was starting his military service with the U.S. Air Force. And again, that would have been U.S. Army Air Force back in World War II. Uh, it says, at that time, uh, I was operating an aircraft inspection and, and repair service at Avalon Airport on the outskirts of Rocky Mount. I agreed to sell it for him and was able to get $450 for the airplane. Everyone agreed that was top dollar. His steerman was the U.S. Navy version of the primary trainer and in today's market would be worth around $75,000. Now this was in 1998, by the way. That plane would probably fetch a half a million dollars today if it were in good shape and flyable. Um, but anyway, it's, it's a really, really nice article and it just really sings the praises of both Foy Pullen and Charlie Brown and both deserving men without a doubt. Uh, number 24, Lee, if you would, and this is just another article. There were so many articles I ran across that were honoring Foy Pullen and his long and luscious career in aviation. Um, and this, again, talks about when he first got started. Um, at age 84, this, uh, he was 84 when this article came out. And um, like I said, it was just a really nice article that they talk about uh, both Foy and Charlie and, and how them two together uh, really changed aviation in this area and indeed in the state. 
Um, earlier, uh, Eric mentioned that uh, they had a, a 70th wedding anniversary. Item number 25, Lee, if you would. We're almost out of time. This is the picture that appeared in the Rocky Mountain Telegram, October 21st, 2007. And it says, Mr. and Mrs. Edwin Foy Pull and the Rocky Mount celebrated their 70th anniversary, September 22nd, 2007. Um, and we'll move on real quickly. Got a couple more here, Lee, real quick. Item number 28. This picture actually appeared in the Rocky Mount Telegram in 19, uh, I'm sorry, in 2008. But it was an old picture. It was originally taken in 1937. And um, Foy Pullen is supposed to be in this picture somewhere from 1937. Okay, Lee. Uh, we mentioned a book, uh, item number 20, uh, 27. This is the book uh, that uh, Foy Pullen co-authored with a lady named Margaret Strickland. Uh, he was 93 years old when his book was published, and it chronicles not only his career, but um, aviation in North Carolina over a period of 90 years. Sadly, um, in 19, I'm sorry, in 2011, uh, Foy Pullen passed away, uh, number 28, Lee. Uh, this is obituary here. It's very long, obviously. It talks about all his uh, many accomplishments in the aviation industry. So I won't try to read that. We're almost out of time. But real quickly, um, number 29, Lee, uh, October 28, 2012, uh, Foy Pullen was inducted into the North Carolina Transportation Hall of Fame. Uh, very deserving award, certainly. And lastly, number 30, just talks, is just a follow up of that article that talks about his induction to the Hall of Fame. Um, you know, I, I, like I said earlier, I can't say I remember Foy Pullen. I'm sure our paths crawled because we were both working at Air Care during the same time frame. Um, and so there's no doubt in my mind. It's ironic that I do remember Charlie Brown so well and, and can't say I remember Foy Pullen specifically, but I know we had to uh, spend at least some uh, waning moments passing, crossing paths at Air Care there somewhere. But I was really pleased to learn so much about the man this week. and. Um, it's just really nice to, to, you know, learn about someone from your hometown who achieved such a, a, a really high level uh, of re recognition, respect, and uh, and deservedly so, I should say. Lee, bring it back to me, folks. That's going to do it for us tonight. We've run slam out of time. I want to thank you so much for tuning in tonight. Hope you learned something about Foy Pulling. Uh, look forward to next week's show. Take care of yourselves. Have a great week and be kind to one another. We'll see you if we go way back Wednesday next week. Bye bye.